In undertaking this study of Frank Herbert's original Dune series from a thematic viewpoint, it is of huge importance to separate the themes as little as possible. What most pleased Herbert was to see the interwoven themes, the fugue-like relationships of images that exactly replay the way Dune took shape. And when we do tease apart the thematic threads of Dune's themes, we soon find them re-emerging with each other. Frank's deliberate attempts to subvert the typical protagonists of the golden age of science fiction were altogether successful, though presented in his usual paradoxical way, and I believe this is a term we can often apply to the vast scope of this piece of work. Herbert in writing Dune involved himself with recurrent themes that turn into paradox, and the true nature of this is apparent when examining any of these three major themes. In attempting to return the genre to a greater literary standard, and deliberately attacking the typical science fiction protagonists of the Golden Age, he turned to Victorian science fiction for inspiration. In his study of evolution taken from the work of the likes of Samuel Butler, he developed notions of evolution that emerged in the late 19th century, to create both a historical framework that lent gravitas to his Dune universe, while simultaneously providing the necessary trappings and inspirations for his great anti-hero, Paul Atreides. As readers, we follow him on his hero quest, only to be cleverly duped by an inversion of themes, and discover that he is a genocidal murderer on a scale never before seen. Herbert's paradox here is that in creating Paul Atreides as an initially sympathetic character, despite his actions, we realise that they are for a greater good, and our sympathies remain with him. We manage to justify this somehow, as he is the hero, or at least appears to be. However, with the prescience the reader attains through the historical documents of the Dune series, we do come to look at him in a different light. When we are able to perceive the golden path, from Leto II's point of view. His analysis and criticism of his father is an extension of the reader's pre-existing ideas, with the additional twist that Leto II contains his own father's memories within his consciousness. He not only considers his father as failing to set in motion the golden path, he also considers him to be not Fremen. In that sense, Paul as the inheritor of Leot also represents Western man. In turn, Herbert's attack against the science fiction protagonists of the Golden Age was coupled with his philosophy of superheroes being disastrous for a society that had been overtaken by the periodic messianic impulses that mankind inflicts upon itself. In doing so here, once again Herbert presents a convincing and detailed viewpoint of this inaction but also paradoxically shows us at the same time that we really do need heroes. We just shouldn't worship them as gods. In the case of Leto II, we have perhaps one of literature's most intriguing characters, a tyrant who is a warning that you should be careful what you wish for. Simultaneously, the warning that Herbert presents us with in the Dune series, that ecology may be the next bandwagon that such a charismatic leader may use to create their own Camelot pattern, is also well realised. With his presentation of ecology in a never before seen detail, this warning is expressed to its ultimate and tragic conclusion, with the Fremen, as a sophisticated tribal desert people, being manipulated to their eventual destruction. How is this done? By the religious impulse that overcomes them in their need for a messiah. Coupled with the strongest of desires, to create an Eden out of hell. The warning Herbert presents in the Dune series is of the human dependency on systems as a means to an end. Again this is presented as a paradox, with Western man being represented as a mechanistic being who can solve any problem with the use of systems, and who views everything in the universe in such a way. Contrasted with the natural integration of the Fremen in how they live on the harsh environment that is Arrakis, we are casually led to believe that their seemingly more natural way of interacting with their ecosystem is not presented in any systemic way. However, such a people could only live in an environment like Arrakis by developing the most completely immersive systems possible. Their way of life is full of systemic approaches 
coupled with the ecology of Arrakis, and as such, their view of ecology can be seen as having many subsystem forms such as cultural, social, religious, economic, sexual, political, and even mythological. The paradox here is that the Fremen understand systems better than the planetologists of Dune, who seek to create them wherever they can. In subverting the typical hero of the science fiction establishment of the Golden Age, Herbert was turning his back on the tropes of this period in science fiction history, but he was also very much a part of it. Dune was published initially in Analog, a publication whose editor was John W. Campbell, but it was this editor's refusal to publish Dune Messiah that we see the true subversion of Dune and its success. It would also see Frank Herbert being partially cast out of the paradise that was the Campbellian dominated magazine era. Hence, Dune is a Janus facing work, in subverting the traditions of the stale, technically orientated, and stylistically sparse works of the Golden Age. Herbert cast off from this period and continued to write literature that was intelligent, well written, and featured intricate complexities and good characterization. The Dune series had the vast sense of epic space opera that it inherited from the Golden Age, but also a real immersion into the inner space of the human psyche, that trait the new wave so eagerly sought. Dune will forever be part of both worlds, and yet isolated from them as well. This is the paradox that is Frank Herbert's Dune series. In a way, it was the beginning of a new wave all on its own, but it was a wave that would swell and gather to a momentum that still carries it forwards today. Frank Herbert was indeed a man of two worlds, as the Dune series is of two science fiction worlds, though not really belonging to either. This is why the series stands out in particular amongst all science fiction. In a way, Dune is a hero to science fiction, having its own little Camelot pattern that sets it apart from all else, yet allows us to admire it so readily. Its complex and interweaving themes continue to amaze us, and hold strong resonance for a new readership in the modern world, where many of its allegories and warnings still persist today. As such, its place in science fiction history is unique, and not likely to change any time soon. It stands alone. Whether Dune is the greatest science fiction book of all time will always be a matter of individual taste to critics and readers alike, and like a great deal of science fiction as a work, the series has its time and place. The series as a whole increases in complexity and moves away from the fantastical, but immerses its readers in a universe that evolves naturally and continues to pose questions rather than answer them. The combination of fantasy elements, mythology, Byzantine intrigue, its carefully interwoven themes, make Dune and its sequels a body of work that will have its own unique place amongst science fiction for a long time to come. I believe that it is fair to suggest the reasons Frank Herbert's Dune series fails to come under a greater deal of academic scrutiny are due entirely to a small number of factors. These are 1. The sheer scale and scope of the narrative. 2. The Dune series actual physical length. 3. The degree of interconnectivity of themes, motifs and symbolism within the text itself. Within my own study of Herbert's Dune series, the consistent problem has been insufficient space to deal with any given topic, understanding that each theme is deeply interconnected with the others. To that extent I have had to leave out a substantial body of work which incorporates itself greatly into the other themes, and which would have amounted to another two chapters. I would therefore like to recommend for further study two particular areas of interest bearing in mind that they would need to be viewed in relation to the chapters in this thesis, and not as isolated works. I believe an examination of sex and gender within the Dune series would help provide a more complete approach to this study, focusing on the strong feminist aspects of the Dune series, especially in Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune. Any examination of Dune's female characters, such as in Jack Hans' The Traditionalism of Women's Roles in Frank Herbert's Dune, 
are never presented as an examination of the whole series. Han's study of women's roles in the Dune series only presents his query about Dune itself, ignoring the rest of the series. Hand concludes that one finds a male-dominated society where even the most ambitious females' responses are traditional in means and in effect. This is contrary to the strong female roles presented throughout the Dune series, especially in the later novels, and does not consider the level of deceit and statecraft that the Bene Gesserit use to manipulate the power politics of the Imperium. The kind of traditional roles that female characters are presented in throughout the series are often undertaken as disguises to advance their own causes. The levels of planning, cunning and patience in carrying out their desired agendas represent a degree of intelligence, cunning as well as martial and political prowess that goes beyond any level of traditional roles. In considering Herbert's representation of gender in the Dune series, one must also look at this subject in relation to the themes of evolution, religion and to a degree the messianic hero, which is very much a Bene Gesserit creation, albeit one that they lose control of. Herbert's views on homosexuality are also notable, and considered certainly today in a negative light. The Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, in his standing as one of science fiction literature's great villains, is a character of great evil, intelligence and cunning. The more malignant aspects of his character are, however, presented in light of his sexual appetites, which include homosexuality and his paedophilic interest in Paul Atreides at the beginning of the series. The Baron's sexuality is combined with his sadism and his great obesity to create a villain that is to be loathed by his physical appearance and sexual deviancy. Herbert presents other viewpoints of homosexuality later on in the Dune novels, and especially in God Emperor of Dune. Here he criticises the homosexual and adolescent nature of the military, and presents us with an all-female religious army in the form of the God Emperor's fish speakers. Herbert's attitudes to homosexuality are in part to do with his views on evolution, seeing it as an evolutionary dead end. His views were also in part to do with his relationship with his youngest son Bruce Calvin Herbert, who was homosexual, something Frank was never really able to accept. Nevertheless, it does appear that Herbert's attitudes towards homosexuality do to a certain extent mellow over the 20 years or so of writing the Dune series. A look at the nature of religion and politics would also be useful in the light of a thematic study of the Dune series. Both of these spheres of influence are intimately linked with all of the themes in the Dune series, and elements of these can be found in the study of the messianic hero, the use of ecology as a political stage, and the use of religion in the evolutionary designs that are created out of the Butlerian Jihad. Of particular interest is the use of religion as a tool of politics and statecraft, especially by the Bene Gesserit, who masquerade as a religious order and are in actuality a mental physical school whose primary purpose is politics. The use of religion as a political tool by the Atreides in particular and the combination of this in using the political and religious ecology of the Fremen to present Paul as a messianic hero is of great interest to the study of the Dune series. The religious aspects of evolution as a tool to shape the social and political systems of the Dune universe is also worthy of further study in relation to the other major themes. The economic and social aspects of the Imperium's political institutions, such as the feudal Faifreloik system, the houses of the Landsrat, the Emperor, as well as the Guild and Chome would also provide a more complete understanding of Herbert's Dune universe. Hello, my name's Doc Sloan and here we are at the end of our journey into Frank Herbert's Dune series. I want to thank you all very much for watching. This has been a great learning experience for me and has actually allowed me to do something with this work that has been sitting buried for um, 11, 10, 10 or 11 years. So uh, this is it, actually, by the way. Everything that you've watched, every word is this entire thesis, word for word. Um, there's 103,000 words in this, with another 10,000 in the footnotes. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this experience. Um, I'm sorry about the music, by the way. I'm a bit deaf. Um, we have it fixed. 
Apologies to anyone who's had their ears bashed. I'm genuinely quite sorry about that. I've read the Dune series about eight times in total over those three years where I was studying this project, and I'm not prepared to just read it again just yet, but uh, I think I'll be digging out my own copy whenever Denis Villeneuve's movie arrives, hopefully sometime this year. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much all again for watching. I hope this finds you all safe in this strangest of times. And uh, look after yourselves and your loved ones. Take care. All the best. Bye-bye.